whatever energy is in me, I am transmitting. And so we can change our environment like the Framingham study just by the energy that we're holding. We are surrounded by love. We came from love into physical bodies. Those beings and those states of consciousness are there with us absolutely every single moment. The only variable is, are we aware of it? When you are having an ecstatic experience of love, blessing, joy, gratitude, it is powerful. We have a whole lobe of our brain designed to help us just feel positive emotions. Just filling your own heart, your own being with self-acceptance and self-love is so very important. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to communicate with your soul or speak with the other side, then do we have the Tapping Into Spirit show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Dawson Church, scientist extraordinaire and also a world-renowned expert on EFT tapping. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how you can use tapping to communicate with your soul, spirits, angels, and the other side of the veil. So welcome back to the show, Dawson. Are you ready to shine? Michael, like everyone else, I was born ready to shine. I wake up ready to shine. And shining is what we came here to do. So absolutely. Woohoo! That's kind of the subdued woohoo when you have a rooster sleeping in the back of the <laughs> RV. <laughs> you don't have him competing with you while you're doing your show. No, no he wins 140 plus decibels. He <laughs> wins every single time, Dawson. <laughs> Uh, and, and have you ever interviewed him, Michael? You know, that's a, that's a worthwhile endeavor because I've learned, he, he's been with us for over a year now. I keep learning new things. And what I've learned here in the Jersey hikes over the last few days is that if I walk past someone and he doesn't get to say hi to them, he will crow. If I say hi to them, he's fine. But he wants to be like a few days ago, he hopped up and he got in front of the camera. And he's going like this, wondering if the camera's on. <laughs> he knows he's the star. <laughs> so yeah, he has no doubt. And now he needs to convince all the rest of us of the same thing. Oh, there's no convincing. When you see him on camera, and I'll, I'll bring him out. I'll bring him out at the end, and you can say hi to him. You'll understand he is, he is like Elvis reincarnate. So he, I go out on the town, I, if I was whatever Hollywood A-lister, more people would probably come to me with the rooster than the A-lister. It is crazy. I will draw a critical mass crowd anywhere, even like a Home Depot. All of a sudden, there's 20 people around me, and then there's people coming in from all directions to see who or what's going on. On that note, let's talk about critical mass and the angels. I want to go back a few years. Did angels save your life? What we think of as angels or beings on the other side, something that is there in consciousness all the time, and only because we often drop out of awareness of that state of consciousness do we think it's special or unusual. I remember being at a conference with Doreen Virtue many, many years ago, and Doreen Virtue was doing angel readings from stage. There were about 2,000 people there, big, big crowd, and so she was she was she had people up on stage and she was asking the volunteers to come up there and get an angel reading from, from Doreen. And I sat there in the back of the audience with my wife and watched literally 2,000 people almost mobbing the stage. Doreen, choose me, choose me. I want to hear from my angels. I want to hear from my angels. And I was just roaring with laughter in the back. And I sat there and said to my wife, Christine, I said, Donnie, look at that. They're all focused on the stage and Doreen wanting to hear from their angels. And their angels are all right there behind them, tapping them on the shoulder and saying, hey, 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 here I am. Just turn around and be aware of me. I'm here all the time. I'm there for you. So that's the reality, is that we are surrounded by love. We were born, we came from love into physical bodies. We are consciousness. We are spirit. We are non-local as much as we are physical. And those beings and those states of consciousness are there with us absolutely every single moment, Michael. The only variable is, are we aware of it? So angels save my life every day. Angels and uh, beings of consciousness, beings of light, beings of, beings of joy, beings of infinite intelligence are just there. The only question is, when they show up, are you reaching out your hand to your alarm clock 
at 6 a.m. and hitting the snooze button because <laughs> that's what most people are doing. They're simply sleepwalking through life. So, Swami Satchanananda said most people die the way they have lived. And we are here in these bodies, and we can attune to those levels of awareness anytime we choose to. The only variable is, are you willing to show up and be awake? I'm still going to go back there. I still want to go back, if I could, to 1 a.m. many years ago in your neighborhood, the last day you were in the neighborhood, and your wife woke up. What do you think happened? Why'd she wake up? Yeah, and I've asked her that question because I was sleeping soundly, and even though there was the there was all this chaos in the outside world, the wildfire racing toward our home, racing toward our area, I was just sleeping soundly through it all. And her explanation is that she felt as though she was attuned to nature and attuned especially to our two cats. We had two beautiful white Siamese cats. They used to sleep in the garage, not in the house. And that night, they had been acting totally weird. And she, she, she her explanation is that there was some message from the cats that woke me up. So she had some kind of experience of that, of that being true. Me, I was the one sleeping through it. I needed her shaking me by the shoulder to wake me up. So consciousness did come through. A wildfire came through. We don't need to go there today. We've had that in past episodes. But something with consciousness saved your lives. Yes. And the other big question I have is why... Sometimes are we aware of those messages from nature, the universe, and why are we other times not aware of them? Like I look back at my life and there's been some things that I just didn't see coming. And I, I don't know at this point what the answer is, why some things blindside me, other things I'm just really aware of, and I, I just seem to have this, this ability to sense things happening in the future. Other times it's not there. So I don't know the answer to that question. Do you believe... When we look at EFT tapping, and I want to dive in there today for, for people who are not familiar, because it's been years since we've, we've had an interview on EFT tapping. For everyone, we have a, a whole library at this point of Dr. Dawson Church shows, well worth checking each one of them out. But our minds are often too cluttered, like everybody wanting to go up on stage. They're looking for somebody else to communicate with their angels because their minds are full. Their cup is flowing over. They can't accept anything else. Do you feel if we do EFT tapping to kind of dial back the nervous system or get the whirling mind to slow down a little bit, that helps us plug into consciousness or the other side of the veil? EFT is the best trauma release method I know. That's why I teach it. I use it every day myself. And if you are the average person, maybe not with any huge trauma, but just the average grab bag of negative things from your past. It's so useful to release it. If you have PTSD, if you have traumatic stress, it's vital to release it. If you don't, it has all kinds of bad effects in your body later on. And what trauma does is it captures your imagination, it captures your attention. So we have different networks in the brain. The trauma network is the emotion network. If I am focused on me, on myself, on my life, on my body, on my money, on my circumstances, my job, my health, all of those things are part of self-awareness. And that part of the brain also is the seat of suffering. So we suffer, we're self-aware, and we have emotion that is layered into that. If we have a threat to our existence, either real or imagined, now we're in that place of traumatic stress, that captures our attention. Why? Because 100,000 years ago, a million years ago, you needed to notice any threat and react to it just like that. So it's highly adaptive to have this attention network, and it's called in psychology the brain's negativity bias. It was so useful for our brains to evolve that way. But when your brain is functioning under stress, it is has that focus on the bad stuff, and you don't have any spare capacity for breathing, for really centering yourself in in anything more and greater than yourself. You don't have any ability to to create inner peace. You don't have the ability to focus on well-being. And so there are these two networks. There's the default mode network involved with stress, and there's the enlightenment network focused on attention, compassion, love, gratitude, and all those positive emotions. And so when you are stressed, and your, your whole stress network in the brain is active. You just can't go to that enlightenment space. 
if you learn to handle stress, if you use EFT and release all that stress, suddenly the brain is no longer captured, your attention is no longer captured and focused on all the bad stuff in your life, you then can breathe, you start to sense other realms of possibility, you then become aware of your attention isn't captured by local reality, you move into non-local reality. At that point, you sense yourself as far greater than this little local bag of skin and bones, and that's when you start to have transcendent experiences. And those are powerful. They engage these four networks of the brain. They engage the attention network. When you are having an ecstatic experience of love, blessing, joy, gratitude, it is powerful. So you pay attention to it. it. It grabs your brain's attention network. It also shuts down that default mode network, the suffering self. And when we hook mystics up to EEGs and MRIs, we see that part of the brain shut down in just a moment when people are entering that stage of compassion. It lights up the compassion network. We have a whole lobe of our brain designed to help us just feel positive emotions. So gratitude, love, joy, humor, wisdom, compassion, all of these things, those are handled by a part of the brain called the insula. That part of the brain is highly active in that kind of a state. So there we are having all these wonderful feelings and then we connect with that source of all it is, something higher than ourselves, and we get to live in that space too. So that if, if we tap, when we tap and release trauma, that frees up our brain to function on that higher level. We then connect with all of those, those realms of reality, and then that becomes more and more where we stay and who we are. Thank you. And you did amazingly well for having a kitty in my face and kitty tail. <laughs> Forget about third eye. It was, it, was, it was bifurcating my face with tail. <laughs> Too funny. And then he, he keeps walking back and forth as well. So he's making sure he gets the attention. Yes. Couple key pieces out of this. First off, backing up several steps, you said this is amazing for trauma, but if you don't have trauma, there will be bad effects later on. What did you mean by that? No, no, if you do have trauma, there will be bad effects later on. Uh, trauma is epigenetic. It literally produces little tags called microRNAs on your genes. It can silence genes, and those genes being silenced is associated with anxiety, with depression, with decreased muscle mass, decreased um, bone density, all kinds of, of sequels to living a stressed life. Thank you. And therefore, when you say you know, EFT tapping helps with, helps tremendously. In fact, uh, you've done the studies on this uh, and there are studies, large amounts of science backing this up. But trauma is not necessarily what we think. I believe we can be traumatized if we simply go and watch the news today, we can be traumatized if we go to a PTA meeting today. We can be traumatized if we wear a mask or don't wear a mask. But basically, it is so incredibly easy to be facing a very substantial fight or flight uh, stressor these days. Yeah. And so there are all these competing demands for our attention. And do we pick up our cell phone and look at the news, look at our news feed, look at our social media, or do we tune into something else? And what I encourage people to do is, I'm not saying never tune to social media, never watch the news. What I recommend doing is the first thing you do in the day is attune to the universe, tune to the all that is, attune to the infinite source of love in which we all dwell. So if that's the first thing you do in the morning, that then is the framing for your day. It also is powerful because during sleep, our brains drop down into the two slowest brain waves of delta, the slowest wave, and theta, the wave just a little bit higher than that, and then alpha as well. And then above that is beta, the wave of our, of our ordinary waking consciousness. When we sleep, though, we drop down into alpha. That's that drifting sensation when you're falling asleep. Then you go into deep sleep delta for about 90 minutes. Then you have a period of rapid eye movements. You go into theta brain waves. And then when you wake up, you go into alpha and into beta. And if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do in the morning is you pick up your cell phone and you look at the news, you're going to then orient your attention to the bad stuff in the world, at least the neutral stuff in the world, and not to the most positive possible highest vibration. 
But if your brain, while it's still in that delta theta semi-sleep state, if you then tune into the universe, if you then meditate and turn your attention to the all that is, an ecstatic state that is available to us in every every moment. If you are breathing consciously, if you're mindful, now suddenly your attention, you've taken this, this precious facility we have of attention and you've turned it to the infinite, to love and joy and gratitude and compassion. You fill your mind, you fill your heart, fill your body with that first thing in the morning. That then frames your whole day. Later on, you can look at the news. Later on, you can look at social media. You can go do those things. You aren't, we aren't called or required to go and live in a monastery and detach ourselves from the world totally. We can be completely immersed in everyday reality, changing diapers, making a living, driving a bus, whatever it is we do. So we can do everyday local stuff, but we do it then from the perspective of being one with the all that is, and that changes everything. In the studies I have in my new book, This Brain, I have research there showing that if you do this, if you attune to that level of reality, people become up to five times more able to solve complicated problems in their daily lives. In a set of Harvard studies, the research showed that if they do that for an hour in the morning, they get 48 hours of increased productivity. You're much better at your job. Your creativity, your ability to handle things creatively more than doubles. So now, if you have framed your whole local life in terms of non-local reality, if you've tuned into the angels, your guides, and tuned into spirit, whatever terminology you use, if you tune into that and then come down to local reality, you're just much better at local reality. So you're a better investor, you're a better father or mother, you're a better partner, a better spouse, a better employee, a better employer, a better parent, a better child. All of those things are improved by that act of first, first thing in the morning, attuning to the all that is. So that's the way to do it. Attune to there, direct your attention there first thing, and then you go and deal with local reality. Thank you. And to me, what you're doing with that, that term attunement is, is you are not only getting in sync, in vibrational alignment, we can call it harmony with the all that is, but now you've got the all that is on speed dial because the connection's already been made. And if you talk to people, yeah, who, who are doing this, it's just remarkable. They'll have ideas. They'll have thoughts. Albert Einstein said that all great scientific discoveries and breakthroughs are made in that kind of a state. So Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich, said, you just can't solve your problems at the level of local reality. You have to move. And he called it his invisible council. He would take problems into his invisible council. And he'd say, okay, my invisible council, I'm summoning here St. Teresa. I'm summoning St. Francis. I'm summoning Jesus and Muhammad. And Thomas Edison is on my invisible council. Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. So he had this invisible council of beings that he would go and talk to. And he'd come back from that altered consciousness with remarkable solutions to local problems. But he said you can't figure them out at that local level. That's why we wrote Awe, the Automatic Writing Experience, the book hiding behind my left shoulder here, is to help people get in touch with their invisible counsel. But I'm going to bring it back full circle, and then let's talk tapping here. You can't really get to your invisible counsel if you're in a state of fear, in a state of fight or flight, if you're entrained to the badness of the world or the inner trauma, can you? You're trying to solve problems at that level, and they just can't be solved at that level. So if your attention is captured by that level, then your whole neuro neurology, your whole biology is engaged at that level, and any chance of a transcendent experience is, is minimal. Thank you. So can you go over the basics? We'll call it tapping 101 to tap into spirit, we'll say. How do we begin and how does this work? The body is a really good guide, Michael. And so when you think about, say, attuning to the all that is and having those transcendent experiences, what does your body tell you is in the way? And that's likely to be buried trauma. When you're a child, when you're six months old, or one year old, two years old, before language develops, you tend to bury bad experiences in your body. So tune in and see what your body's telling you. Think about meditating 
And do you feel itchy? Do you feel a sense of, of, of dread in your body? Do you feel uh, a hardness, a knot in your heart or your chest or your, your belly? So what is it physically you've got going there? We also recommend you use imagery. So in my book, The EFT Manual, I say, for all of those buried body memories, just use an Im image. Like I had one doctor I worked with, and I asked him to think about what his impediment was. And he said, I feel as though I have this bowling ball in my intestines, a big gray bowling ball in my intestines. And he felt so weighed down by that feeling. So tune into your body and then tap on that. As we tap together, I tapped with him on all the acupuncture points. His energy shifted. The bowling ball shrunk down to the size of a ping pong ball. <laughs> and then it disappeared completely. And then he felt great. That's when you can move into those state, states. So that's how you tap to release that very layer of trauma. So thank you. So let's say that, that somebody is watching today and they have, uh, they've just watched the news and it's triggered a memory. It's triggered a thought, something that took place or didn't take place because of all of the current challenges. And they're pretty freaked out and they, they want to go angels help me, guides help me, and instead the brain is just freak out mode. What are the points we tap on and do we need a clearing statement or can we just lean into the energy? How would this work? Well, paradoxically, with EFT, you tap on the bad stuff. You don't tap on the good stuff. You focus on the bad stuff. Not only that, you actually enhance the bad stuff. I worked with one woman who was an athlete, and she was a psychotherapist, but she also did a lot of athletics. But she'd had persistent pain in her rotator cuff for, for several years. And it was always there. It, it fluctuated. Some days it was a 3 or a 4 out of 10 in intensity. Other days it was a 7 or 8 in intensity. But it was always at that, that same level. And so we not only focused on the pain in her rotator cuff and all the feelings she had about injuring her shoulder as well, we focused on the emotions, we focused on the physical sensations, we try to make it worse. So we try to capture that maximum sensation, we try to feel it at that seven or eight level. And so we use the imagery like, okay, the pain's getting worse, I will always have that pain. Now, that might seem crazy to affirm. You're affirming, I'll always have the pain. You're affirming, the pain is going to get worse. Why on earth would you say negative statements? We're taught to have positive affirmations, a positive worldview, to let things go, move to the positive. And yet with EFT, we do the exact opposite. <laughs> we invite people to explore the negative. And we do that because we live in a world in which we've been trained and encouraged since children to move to the positive. So your pet bunny dies when you're four years old, and your mom says, don't worry, Susie, I'll, I'll buy you a new bunny. And so your grief doesn't get recognized. Your grandmother dies when you're six, and nobody says anything. Your best friend moves away when you're seven, and your dad says very helpfully, oh, darling, don't worry, you'll make, a, make new friends. And yet all that grief just remains there unprocessed because people are telling you all the time, go to the positive, go to the positive. So with EFT, we literally let people wallow in the negative. The fear, this pain, this shoulder pain will never go away. The fear that it'll get worse, the fact that fear I'll be crippled. So all these things, but what we're doing at the same time, magically, is we're adjusting our energies. We're tapping on acupuncture points. We're smoothing out our energies, our, our, our emotional brains are getting the signal to calm down, and then we can literally have an opportunity to imagine and inhabit the very worst things that might happen. And when we do that, something quite wonderful occurs, which is that we counter condition that old conditioning, and we then snap out of it. We then grieve it fully, we grieve all of our losses, we grieve all of our fears, and once we fully explore them, but we've been adjusting the energy all the time through tapping, we then bounce back into the positive. So that's the paradox. We actually deep, dig deep into the negative, and then spontaneously, once we've cleared this pool of trauma below the surface of consciousness or in consciousness, we then naturally bounce, bounce back into those higher energies. Thank you. Would you mind walking us through, um, through a brief example? So I've got a stiff knee right now, nothing bad but I've got a little bit of a stiffness in the knee. Maybe we will tap on my knee and see how that feels as I'm increasing my mileage and having a blast, 
but I've hit that temporary limit and the knee is going, oh, we're going to take it a little easy. I want to see if maybe there's something that we can clear in there to allow the energy to flow better. How's that? Absolutely. It's a great test. And so tune into your knee and really feel that feeling. Now, you see, just doing that, Michael, that's mindfulness. Normally, we have a pain. Yeah. We want to take a painkiller, make it go away. And now, rather than trying to make your body's messages go away, you're listening. And so now give it a number, 0 through 10. How intense is it? Uh, 2. It's not that bad. 2. <laughs> okay. I could give it a 3 two. if we okay. wanted to. I'm very attuned so, to the body. Okay. So if you really tune into it, it might be a 3, but it's probably around 2. I'll give you a three for kicks. Heck, we could go. I'm going to, it really hurts. It really hurts. It really hurts. Okay, I'm making it a four, Dawson. I'm giving you everything I've got. <laughs> Keep going, Michael. <laughs> my knee will never work again. Oh, my. See, I, I, who likes even okay, saying tap. that? Okay, so I'm tapping on, so tap, on tap my on karate po okay. spot on the bottom of my hand. Yep. And say my knee will never work properly again. My knee will never work properly again. My knee will never be strong again. My knee will never get strong again. My knee will never get strong again. My knee will never get strong again. It might get weaker. Ooh, my knee is going to get weaker. <laughs> my knee is definitely going to get weaker. My knee is definitely going to get weaker. My knee is definitely get weaker. Good. It'll become so weak, I'll probably need a need a knee replacement surgery. It'll become so weak they'll call me Hoppy. It'll become so weak they'll call me they'll call me Hoppy. When I'm in the water they'll call me Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen people whose conditions have got worse over time. It will get so worse I won't be able to use it. It will get so bad I won't be able to use it. It will get so bad I won't be able to use it. It will get why am I laughing, Dawson? <laughs> Okay, now tap on your governing meridian, top of the head over here. Okay. It'll get so bad I won't be able to use it. It'll get so bad I won't be able to use it. It'll get so bad I won't be able to use it. It'll get so now bad. Now think, I won't Michael, be able to use it. about people in your family who've degenerated with age. There are people who've just got their physical conditions get worse over age, over the, as they age. Just think about those people. So I've seen people in my own family who get worse as they age. And then eyebrow points, this is your bladder meridian, of, so, so tap on both sides of the bladder meridian. So I've watched my relatives get older and more feeble, and that might be, might be me. I've watched my relatives get older and more feeble, and that might be me. I've watched my relatives get older and more feeble, and that might be me. I've watched my relatives get older and more feeble, and that might be me. I've watched. That's my... enough. Now tap on the side of your eyes. Now, yeah. That's your gallbladder meridian. So down, down a little bit. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Gallbladder meridian. So what's the worst that could happen, Michael? Let's just give give it a voice. What's the worst that could happen here? The worst that can happen is I won't be able to hike and ride and run again. The worst that can happen is I won't be able to hike and ride and run again. The worst that could happen is I won't be able to hike and ride and run again. The worst that can happen is I won't be able to hike and ride and run again. That's good. That's enough. Now, under your eye, that's your stomach meridian. The worst that can happen is I won't be able to hike and ride and run again. Okay, where's your favorite place to ride? Hmm, give me a mountain, any mountain. <laughs> okay. I'll never be able to ride that, whatever it's called again. I'll never be able to ride up a mountain again. I'll never be able to ride up a mountain again. I'll never be able to ride up a mountain again. I'll never be able to ride. Yeah. End point of, under your nose, it's end point of your governing meridian. And now just tune into that sensation in your knee, the actual physical sensation in your knee, or whatever's left of it right now. Now go ahead and tap on your central meridian under your lower lip. Keep your eyes open. 
and just say out loud this body sensation. This body sensation. I'm tuning into this body sensation. I'm tuning into this body sensation. Now tap on your kidney meridian here, your shoulder blades. I'm listening to my body. I'm listening to my body. And feeling its sensation. And feeling its sensation. And accepting myself the way I am. And accepting myself the way I am. I accept the sensation. I accept the sensation. Just the way it is. Just the way it is. Now tap on your sides. It's your spleen meridian. So right, yeah. That's good, yeah. So tuning into your body again. Really tuning in. Keep your eyes open. And then one more time over here. No words this time. And then tap on the back of your hand. And we'll do a little bit of delta, theta, brainwave induction. So close your eyes and open them. Then without moving your head, look hard down to the left. Okay, let your eyes go back to neutral again. Now, hard down to the right. So if you're watching the face of a giant clock, you'd be looking at five o'clock right now. Now, just look at three o'clock without moving your head. Look at two, look at one. Imagine looking at 12, so head centered, that your eyes all the way up to the ceiling. You're looking at 12 on this giant clock. Now look at 11, look at 10, look at 9. Now back to 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Hold it at 9 for a moment. Feel your breathing. Notice your knee. Then back to 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Hold it at three, another breath. Then two, one, 12. And relax to stop tapping. And now, what number is your knee? Probably this very one. moment. A one. A one. Okay. And I'll check again in about five minutes, and the chances are it will be lower. Very good. What? So that's what you do. You just tune into your body, accept those messages, do some tapping. Do some catastrophizing, really feel all those possible negative outcomes. And you know, we all have seen people who just decay and die and get worse over time. So um, it is a fear that most of us have at some level. And it's worth addressing those fears and letting them go through tapping. What were we doing with the clock? That is called the nine gamut procedure. And it was developed in the 1980s by a clinical psychologist called Roger Callahan. And what it does is it generates theta and delta slow brain waves in the brain. A lot like we do when we sleep, dream, and then we are able to move through our problems symbolically in dreams. So we generate those brain waves and then we recruit the brain's way of reformatting information and removing our sense of it being a problem using the same kinds of brain waves we have during deep sleep. And does it put you in a more so i here's the layman's terms of what tapping is doing to me it's shorting out a negative loop inside of you what is this technique doing this technique is engaging our learning system that we use during dreams usually in a dream we have a problem we're trying to solve in our our waking life symbolically so the dream is a symbolic way of solving a, an actual problem we have in our waking life. And so we'll try one dream scenario, and maybe it works out, and we feel a sense of release and resolution. Or if we don't, we'll have another dream where we'll try and work out that same problem symbolically. And this happens during theta sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And it's called rapid eye movement sleep because even though our eyes are closed, our eyes are moving around rapidly during those brief periods in, in, in our sleep cycle 
when we're in theta brainwave sleep. Most of the night we're in delta brainwave sleep. Our brain's doing a lot of pruning of unused neural pathways. During theta, it is building new neural connections. So we're using, we're, we're putting the brain deliberately into theta and delta with the eye movements. Fantastic. So we're talking today about tapping into spirit, communicating more with angels, guides, all that is, whatever we want to call it. We get up in the morning, we go to a place of attunement, we go to a place of love or whatever we want to call it. We start to get into vibratory alignment. How can then doing, for instance, a round of tapping help us to be able to communicate with spirit throughout the day? So when we wake up, typically our attention goes to all of our problems, all of our challenges, what's going to happen in that day, our schedule, the, the, uh, the people we'll meet, all the future events of that day. And that's very natural for your mind to go there. So you want to interrupt that pattern and use that precious time when your brain is still having a lot of delta and theta waves, a little bit of alpha, very small amount of beta, use that time to refocus your attention. So you tap during that initial time to release everything else. I personally tap on releasing the person I was yesterday. I want to be the person I am today. I want to be fresh in every moment. I'm tapping to release everything else. I'm actually doing the nine gamut eye movements as well. Did you have this laugh before you started tapping? No, <laughs> I didn't, Michael. I, I was married to somebody who actually was pretty uh, critical of me and didn't like my laughter. So I to avoid triggering her, I didn't laugh. So <laughs> I let go of a lot of trauma and, and then just let myself, my, my spirit be. I consider it, Dawson, the Buddha laugh. You have the Buddha laugh. And I think the Buddha, one of the reasons that the Buddha was the Buddha is he didn't have those obscurations. He didn't have those layers of wounding or he could at least see them and not be them. And that's what you've been doing, hasn't it? You've been peeling away these layer of wounds to reveal what was already there always there. There are, two, there are two things we have to do as adults in life. So during our childhood, adverse things happen. We inherit conditioning. We inherit all of the wisdom of our tribe, some of the functional, some of the dysfunctional. But we have to tap away and release our wounding. When we do that, though, Michael, our potential comes into play. We're no longer being sabotaged by our trauma, by our wounding. We then can move into our full potential. And that typically will mean a lot of changes. People's bodies will change. Their health will change. Their careers often change. When I began, when I learned tapping and began to meditate every day, I was 45 years old. I'd been in book publishing my whole life. Publishing was all I knew. I knew how to publish books, and I was really good at that profession. But I'd been in there my whole 20-year career, and within a few months, I was doing something quite different. So your career will change, your relationships will change, your body will change, all kinds of things shift. But that's moving into those levels of potential. And most people never do that. They're so captured by their trauma. They never move there. So one of the, the seductions of the, of the spiritual path is, oh, like I used to be a member of a spiritual community when I was a teenager, and the teaching was, well, you know, we have all this, this, this rubbish at the level of the ego and the level of the local self. We just go meditate, do energy work, and we transcend all of that. And the research shows really clearly it doesn't work. If you try and transcend all of the trauma you have in your life, it becomes the shadow. It becomes the dark side. And that's where there's so much abuse. There's so much dysfunction in these spiritual communities. It's the, it's the unhealed dark side. So you have to come to a neutral point. You have to go heal that trauma. That then liberates your potential. And then you're going to find your body changes, your diet changes, your sense of connection with other people changes, your marriage is probably, probably going to change, your relationship with your children, your parents, everything will start to shift once that, that magic who you are is, is, is born through you. And you know, as a kid, you were that being, you were this glorious dancing angel of spirit just coming into a body, and then stuff happened. My, my wonderful friend, Bessel van der Kolk, says, how does a, a person go from being that dancing firefly 
of uh, of an angel at two and three and four years old, just absolutely in love with the world, to being that addicted, drunk, laying in an alley at the age of 28. What happens? What happens is trauma. And so we have to heal that trauma. And when we do, then that angel comes back again. We all know we were meant to live these full glorious lives. We just don't know how to escape the pull of trauma. That's why EFT is so important. And once we deal with the trauma, naturally we become those powerful beings of, of oneness with the universe that we were born to be and we express all the potential that exists at that dimension of ourselves. Thank you. So I derailed you when we were talking about mornings and you were talking about going to 9, 10, 11 o'clock and I, I yanked you off to your beautiful laugh. Do you remember where you were when I pulled you astray? Well, nine, no, nine, ten in the morning is when you're dealing with everyday life and everyday reality. And that's when it's important to anchor yourself in that transcendent reality first thing in the morning. Very good. So we anchor in that. We clear away some, some wounds in the beginning in the morning. What's actually been your routine? And I have no other way to put it. I asked how you were doing before we started. And you said... I'm in heaven. So I'm very curious if and what this has to do with the work that you're doing on yourself or communicating with spirit. Why are you in heaven, Dawson? You just naturally are after a while. And you're in the state of, of well-being. And when you move out of survival, so initially we're all in survival brain. We have to learn to survive. And then we do that pretty well the first few years of our lives. But when you start to move into what I call in my book, This Brain, the state of being in bliss, and then you're there. After a while, you start to be, so initially you're there in your morning meditation. And for probably 20 years, Michael, that's as far as I got. I would meditate in the morning. I'd feel this transcendent well-being. I'd feel in this, I was in this magical place. You have meetings, you have conflicts, you have issues to deal with. And I would just be in that the whole day. So my one respite, my one place of refuge was that half hour or hour of meditation. But the good news is, if you keep it up, you start to build up those neural pathways. You then start to fire those neurons over and over and over again. Those pathways get bigger and stronger. And then the effects start to bleed through into your everyday world. And that's where the work of Teresa Amabile at Harvard comes in. She did this brilliant series of experiments which showed that if you get there for an hour, that your brain's state has changed for 48 hours, you get 47 hours of increased flow from going consciously into flow for one hour. So now you're more creative, you're more productive, your, your problem solving ability increases as a result of that one hour. But then it was feeling better throughout the day. Then it was spontaneous bliss throughout the day. Then it was like I used to listen to the, the news. I'd have, have national public radio on usually around three or four o'clock in the afternoon, listen to the news. I, I'd be in my car often driving somewhere. So I began to just, I began to just turn off the news, turn off, off the radio and just have a moment's meditation first. And then it was a half hour's meditation. That was my whole commute was meditation. And then suddenly I'd be in line at a store and I'd be in bliss spontaneously. I'd be in, in heaven. I, I, I'd sit I'd, I'd stand in front of the clerk. In fact, yesterday I was buying some groceries and I, I stood there and I just could see angel wings behind the, the lady who was serving me. And so then you relate to her as this angelic being who's utterly precious, who's a child of the universe, and you don't even know her name. And yet you're standing there smiling at her behind her mask. <laughs> in fact, I say to her, I'm smiling behind this mask. And you just have this sense of that being the reality of all the people around you. And so suddenly now, you're in a, a world full of angels. Pick the person who pisses you off. Pick the person who triggers you the most. Imagine them as an angel. For me, right now, the person, I'm getting a little bit cheery as I say this, Michael, there's a guy called Clay Higgins, and maybe you've read about him or heard about him on the news, but he's the, the congressman from, from Louisiana who talked about shooting Black Lives Matter protesters last year. And I have a really hard time imagining Clay Higgins as an angel. So that means Clay Higgins is my spiritual teacher. I need to sit there in meditation. I need to love 
play Higgins unconditionally. And, and I just, that is hard for me to do. <laughs> so guess what? That's my next challenge is to hold Clay Higgins as a perfect child of the universe. And so we begin to have this then move into our everyday life, especially in the places where there are the most conflict and the most, the most discord, where we have the hardest time doing it. Bring your love, bring your compassion to the person who most annoys you, who most triggers you. So whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Clay Higgins, whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's Hillary Clinton, whether it's the head of Facebook or Google or some other company that triggers you, just hold that person in absolute love. Because guess what? That's the perspective of the universe. The universe holds you and me in love. The universe holds everyone in love. When you see the person that way, you're seeing them as the universe sees them. You're seeing them as they really are. And that's the way your whole perspective on life and the world changes. Thank you. And then that is a mighty woohoo. Again, subtude for the root. <laughs> I wanted to go to how you're meditating while you're driving, and we might double back around. I know people are going to be asking about that. But with that said, what you're talking about now, without realizing it, though I'm sure you are, is going from the me to the we. Because if we get a critical mass of people who are holding a, uh, um, what was his, the gentleman's name, Clay Higgins again? Clay Higgins. Uh, Clay Higgins are holding a baby Clay Higgins in our arms and loving up Clay Higgins like the divine being that he is. And if we all can do that even a little bit, we begin elevating consciousness, don't we? We begin rewriting our reality, rewriting the entire world. It is an electron state shift if we can start to hold that space. We are literally shifting our world. In chapter two of my book, Mind to Matter, I talk about emotional contagion. Our emotions spread to people around us. So if I'm happy, this long standing, it's like a 70 year study now called the Framingham Heart Study. It tracks all kinds of dimensions of people in this little town of Framingham, Massachusetts. And when happiness researchers have used that data, they find that if I am happy, my neighbor, who I barely know, is about 35% likely, more likely to be happy. And his neighbor is about 15% more likely to be happy. And then certainly someone I don't know, her neighbor is about 6% more likely to be happy. I'm literally having a contagious effect by who I am. So we are healing the world by healing ourselves. We're also resonant with every other person who is on that energy uh, level. So when I'm with you, when I'm sharing with you, I'm resonating with you. I'm resonating with people all over the world now. When I sit down to meditate, I tune into all the people meditating in the world right now. We are all resonant with the same energetic, the same consciousness reality. And it is not one of strife and conflict and scarcity and lack and misery. It is one of passionate love. You read Rumi, you read St. Teresa, you read St. Catherine, you read St. Francis of Assisi, you read these great mystics and saints, and they are not sitting there saying, oh, I feel good. They're, I mean, St. Francis says, thou my lover, thou hast ravished me. They're talking about it in these orgasmic terms. You shake when you meditate in the same kind of ecstasy as an orgasm. I mean, you are that tune into the universe. So Rumi and Hafiz, all these great mystics, they are tuned in in that way. And you find it is not just an experience of feeling kind of okay. <laughs> You're literally in heaven. And so gradually heaven invades every corner of your life. You, it is just who, who you are and how you are. And you just abandon yourself to the experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you brought up something interesting, which is we often hear that, you know, for instance, we actually have now a school of mystics. And I say that each class is a transmission and everybody's energy raises up. But it doesn't mean that I necessarily am special. It is whatever energy is in me, I am transmitting. Whatever energy is in Dawson, which is why everybody's watching here today, is that the two of us playing a game of tennis is being transmitted. And so we can change our environment like the Framingham study just by the energy that we're holding. Absolutely. Yeah, the energy literally shifts matter around us. Like right now, I'm drinking water. There are amazing studies showing that when you bless water, 
when you intentionally hold water and transmit helium attention into it, it literally changes the bonding angle between the two hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atom. The, the, the molecular structure of water literally changes when there is intention going into it. So we are changing the physical fabric of the world. Other studies in my book, Mind to Matter, show that we change nuclear radiation, the, 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 the rate of radioactive decay. We can literally change that with our energy, with our being. So we're having a remarkable effect on the molecules of the world around us. Thank you. So let's go back to driving the car. Then we're going to go, where can people go to find your work? And, and, and then dive into a meditation in a minute here. What is a meditation we can do or you did while driving the car that brings you into, there's no other way to put it, cranked up like you are the sun itself driving down the road, beaming out love and light and goodness? One really useful thing, focusing on the third eye area of your body. Now, it's very interesting, that third eye area, right behind that is a part of the brain called the mid prefrontal cortex. And what we see in mystics is that the mid prefrontal cortex shuts down when they move into compassion. And the mid prefrontal cortex is the seat of self. It's also a really key brain region that is active when we're suffering. So what you do when you're driving down, down, down the highway in the car, and you wanna be in that transcendent state, one easy thing to do is to simply focus on the third eye area. The chances are if you do that and even meditating, you will start to dial down the activity of the mid prefrontal cortex. And you'll feel more peaceful. Something else you can do is breathe consciously and slowly while you do that. Now these are physical things. If you breathe consciously and slowly, you're sending a signal to your body and you dial up the activity of your parasympathetic nervous system, your anti-stress, your relaxation system. So breathing slowly and mindfully will do that. And so those two things, just those two things alone, nothing else, focusing on the third eye area and then breathing mindfully as you drive, you're still totally alert. In fact, you'll become more alert as you do this. You aren't gonna drift off into some imaginary state where you could, where you could lose track of reality. So now, you're in that space, you're centered. And then one further practice you can do is imagine your heart, breathe from your heart, and imagine your heart connecting with everybody else who's driving or even who's being now. One thing I have people do in my, my little routine called eco meditation is imagine your heart like uh, the sun and having rays and simply radiating its rays to of compassion, of gratitude, of connection to every single atom in the universe. You simply sit there, breathe, feel your heart, be conscious, be in your third eye, radiate out, and then suddenly you're connected with every single atom in the universe. It's pretty hard to be miserable or depressed <laughs> once you've done that. <laughs> so Dawson, where can people go to find your work to begin radiating? <laughs> It'd be too much to say. You will get your own Dawson laugh, but maybe if they come to the, your website, they will get their own Dawson laugh. Where do you want to send people, Dawson? Two places. To get the book Blissbrain, go to blissbrain.com. And then also at that site, you'll get eight free meditations. And I want you just, just to use those. They're only 50 minutes long that we've shown in MRI trials that they literally start to shift the way your brain functions within 30 days. So really quickly, they'll start to reformat the way your brain functions. And that's at blissbrain.com. And then at uh, tappinggift.com, we have a special meditation based on research showing that if you do this, it changes your level of cortisol, dials it down, and dials up your levels of immune markers. So I have a special meditation based on two studies showing that it reduces cortisol and it improves immune markers. And those are at the website tappinggift.com along with the free EFT tapping mini manual. So Bliss Brain for the book and Tapping Gift for the immunity meditation and the manual. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Any last words of wisdom, Dawson, before we dive into a meditation? Love yourself as you are and accept yourself just the way you are. So just filling your own heart, your own being with self-acceptance and self-love is so very important. 
And the way to operationalize that is to tap. And then if you don't have a meditation practice, I've given you plenty of tools here today. Just start immediately. Just download those free, free meditations and then just start doing it. I know the day I began meditation was 2000, the year I began doing meditation every day. It just changed my life quickly. So make a commitment to that daily morning meditation. How often are you connecting with spirit? It's hard to disconnect after a while. It's just you're living life. You're just floating along in this magical life of connection. And very occasionally something happens. You, you disconnect. You have a, you know, some, some event that happens that pulls you out. But, but you, you don't want to be anywhere else. I mean, once you've been in heaven, do you seriously feel tempted to go live anywhere else? <laughs> you get yourself back there as fast as possible when you fall out. Makes sense. Perfectly put, Dawson. And that is being a mystic. Would you mind leading us in, in any sort of meditation? Not sure how you're doing on time. So whatever you feel called would be blissful. Close your eyes. Feel your breath. And imagine yourself breathing in and out. Through your heart. And slow your breathing down to six seconds per in-breath and six seconds per out-breath. And imagine your breath flowing in and out through your heart. And notice the volume of space inside your feet, inside your hands, and inside your whole body. Relax your tongue on the floor of your mouth. And notice the volume of space between your eyes. Notice the breath flowing in and out through your heart. And I'll think of someone, so some being, it could be a guide, an angel, a teacher, a mentor, a being that loves you unconditionally. Think of a being that loves you unconditionally. It could be a dog or a cat, animal, pet. And feel your heart energy connect with this being of unconditional love. And notice how relaxed your tongue is on the floor of your mouth. Notice the infinite space between your eyes. Notice your breath flowing in and out through your heart, six seconds. And notice this heart connection with this being that represents unconditional love. And a beam of connection flowing out from your heart 
to this being of unconditional love. Bask in the experience of unconditional love. Tongue relaxed on the floor of your mouth. Infinite space between your eyes. Six second in breaths and out breaths through your heart. And then gently let go of that ray of energy connecting you with your source of unconditional love and bring your energy all the way back inside your own body, inside your own heart, knowing that unconditional love is always there for you. Feel the volume of space between your eyes. Notice the volume of space inside your hands and feet. And with the next three breaths, bring your attention fully back to the here and now your environment and noticing the volume of space inside your feet ground yourself into our precious mother earth and with the next breath open your eyes look around you notice the smallest green object in your environment Notice anything with the letter Y in your environment. Notice how grounded you are through your feet into the earth. And bring yourself fully back into the here and now, feeling that wonderful feeling in your body realizing that we can connect to unconditional love anytime, we can be in oneness anytime with the infinite universe, and then bring that back into our local experience, our local reality, anytime we choose. <laughs> <laughs> How's your knee, by the way? What number are you? Uh, I think we hit zero now. We were at a Good. one until the start of the meditation. I think we got. I think we got zero. <laughs> yeah, so. tapping the meditation or a winning combination. Couldn't put it better myself. This has been. I got to crank it back up. I'm so jelloed out, Dawson. Phenomenal, my brother. Phenomenal. That's that's all I can say. Phenomenal. And then that's perfect. We move into that mellow state and then we crank it up again and then we're glorious in our other life. So that's absolutely perfect, Michael. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm going to go do a blissful swim in about a half an hour, half an hour to an hour on the lake. And I'm just going to be, ah, and I'm going to bring her right back to this interview, right back to this meditation. It'll be the bliss swim. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I recommend one every day. Excellent. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the bliss brain and begin diving into that unconditional love today and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! Oh my God. All my love, my brother. All my love, all my love, all my life. I don't know about you, but I don't know how to end today's show because I've been so bliss brained by Dr. Dawson Church, telling us how we can, sharing with us, how we can tap into spirit, how we can tap into source, how we can tap into the angels, or tap into heaven. That's really what this is about today, how to tap into heaven. How does it get any better than this? Well, 
pick up on the automatic writing experience or better yet, come on over to automaticwriting.com where we'll teach you with a video-based program plus live classes how you can begin communicating with spirit, how you can begin communicating with your angels and guides on a daily basis. Just as Dawson Church was talking about, about having our invisible counsel, you'll learn through automatic writing how to tap into your invisible counsel as well. You can get it at automaticwriting.com, get the whole video-based program. It's also now out on Audible, the audiobook, so you can get that through Amazon and Audible as well. That's all the automatic writing experience. We're a podcast too. In case you didn't catch that, when you're driving down the road, you can be listening to us. When you're going for your favorite run or hike or whatever it is, when you ingest your podcast, you can be listening to us. You can find us on iTunes and every single way, Spotify, every single place you can get a podcast, you can find the Inspire Nation show. Just favorite it and you'll be able to follow all of our shows. On that note, we have live events every Sunday night on YouTube where you can ask your question, where you can learn how to become a modern mystic. And you can check those out by hitting the subscribe button below and the bell icon to be notified of our next show and our live events. Of course, we also have the School of Mystics every Wednesday evening. You can find that at inspirenationuniversity.com. And here's the link to the next amazing video. Love you guys so, so much. Big thumbs up. Leave your comments if you like this. Shine bright. Woohoo! Love you guys.